uh, let's talk about Easter. Now, Easter is one of the central holidays or holy days of Christianity. It honors the resurrection of Jesus Christ three days after his death by crucifixion. For many Christian churches, Easter is the joyful conclusion to the Lenten season of devoted prayer, fasting, and penitence. Now we have joining us via Zoom, Archbishop John Praise Daniel, Senior Pastor, Dominion Chapel International Church, and National Deputy President, Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria, uh, to discuss the significance of Easter. Uh, good morning, uh, Archbishop, and thank you so much for joining us. And also in the studio, we have... Uh, all right, also in the studio, we have uh, Nuruddin Abdullah, editor of 21st Century Chronicles. He was here with us uh, uh, the previous hour, joining us to, you know, share with us the significance of, uh, uh, or his own take on why the Easter, on the Easter falling during the Ramadan season as well. Thank you so much for staying with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Bishop, for joining us this morning. Um, and it's good to see you again, by the way. Um, what would you, how would you describe this particular season in the life of um, a Christian and um, what, what significance, uh, and a significant bearing, you know, does it have on our Christian calling as a people? Thank you so much. Um, we are here talking about um, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, we do know that this is usually uh, preceded by the lengthy season. And of course, this is the Holy Week. And today, presumably, Jesus was crucified. And uh, eventually, they call it Good Friday. And people are wondering, why Good Friday when you kill a man? Well, that's all in the plan and the purpose of God. It's Good Friday because <clears throat> if Jesus didn't die today, the plan of salvation would have been aborted. You remember in John chapter 1, I mean, John 19, verse 30, when he said, I thirst, and he was given vinegar that was sour to drink, and he couldn't take it, but he bent down his head and declared, it is finished. It means the work of salvation is finished. The work of redemption is concluded, and man can now lay hold of salvation. You know, it was the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that brought the forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no remission of sins. So when Jesus died, was crucified, and his blood was shed, that was when forgiveness was made available. We also see a similar uh, parallel thing that happened in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Joseph was speaking, because Joseph was a typology of Christ in the Old Testament. So Joseph was speaking, and he said to his brothers, you taught it for evil by selling me as a, a slave into Egypt. But God meant it for good to save many a life. And you know, with that experience, Joseph eventually got to Egypt and became prime minister. And so instead of his whole family dying of starvation and hunger, he became the redemption. So he said to them, you made it for evil, but God meant it for good, you know. And so Christians always believe that the things sometimes that look like evil becomes good. Even the death of Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 8 and 9. And the Bible says there that would the princes of this world they did not know. Because if they knew, they wouldn't have crucified the king of glory. But thank God that the evil people didn't know that the death of Jesus was actually going to bring redemption. So when they killed him on Friday thinking the worst was done. They didn't realize that the greatest and the good has been done. So the worst became the good because without the worst, the good will not come. So it's Good Friday because when Jesus died, he made the way of salvation and people could have access to the forgiveness of sins and to redemption. So whatever that was meant for good, God turns it around. I mean, meant for evil, God turns it around for good. Don't forget Romans 8 and verse 28. It says, all things work it together for good. To them that love God and to them who are the call according to his purpose. Amen. Thank you. Okay, now uh, can you please tell us what the significance of, uh, you know, the Lenten period is and, uh, you know, uh, what or whom, what or whom do Christians actually search for in this particular period? 
Well, the lengthy period is a, is a period of dedication. It's a holy, holy month. And uh, simply waiting, fasting, and then remembering the agony that Jesus went through, you know, before his crucifixion. And in most cases, um, it is the uh, Orthodox churches, brethren, that observe Lent. Most Pentecostal churches and other uh, churches usually will do their fasting some at the beginning of the year for 21 days, in January, some for 30 days, some 40, depending. So, but I know my Catholic brethren denomination and other uh, denominations observe the Lenten season very seriously. And I think just like Jesus, before he went to the cross, had to go for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, uh, fasting. So I believe that's the significance to humble ourselves. Because you see, fasting helps us to humble ourselves and then to appreciate the price that God has paid for our redemption, you know, and to be able to dedicate ourselves. And it helps us to renew our strength. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and they will not faint. That's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 30. So fasting helps us to renew our strength. And then you also look at Second uh, Chronicles 7, verse 14. It says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their lands, and I will... Um, I will bless them, I will forgive their lands and cleanse them from their sins. So, fasting helps you to humble yourself, to come before God in repentance, and to seek the face of God for healing. And uh, there's no other time we need healing like now in our nation. So, it's a time of fasting and praying and asking God to have mercy on the nation, Nigeria. We all know, are all aware of the elections and uh, what is ongoing. So, we need the mercy of God. So, it is in this fasting that we seek for the mercy of of God, we seek for the forgiveness of God, and we ask God to heal our land. And truly, Nigeria is healing. And this is that period, which also suggests a period of peace. You know, Jesus speaking, He said, "In the world you will have tribulation, um, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. In the world you shall have tribulation, but in me you shall have peace." That is John sixteen about thirty three. And Jesus said, "But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world." So we have a lot of crises, a lot of problems, a lot of uh, insurgency, killings, and all of that. But during this lengthy period, we're asking for the mercy of God. We're asking that God will uh, look upon us and that God will heal our land and uh, give us um, peace, fairness, justice, and move this nation forward. So that's the significance of lengthy season fasting as far as, far as the Christian fast is concerned. And yeah. Jesus was speaking and says, when you fast, he didn't say if you fast. It means when it's a program that has to happen. Fasting is part of the program, is part of the teaching of Christianity. Now, no Christian should exhume or should uh, exclude themselves for, for from fasting at a certain period of the year. Thank you. Okay, so um, I was actually just going to ask, you know, uh, considering the last thing you actually said, I was going to ask this because a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, Christians uh, seem to not take the Lenten period, you know, uh, as serious as some would actually take it. Some would actually say that it's meant for a specific denomination. Is that true or is it the whole of Christendom that's supposed to fast at this particular Lenten period? Just like I explained earlier, there are people that feel so attached to observing the Lenten season. And like I mentioned, especially the Orthodox churches, like the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the African Church, and many others like that. But there are the independent churches who don't really feel so tight to fast during the Lenten season, but have also, in one way or the other, um, find out the time that is most convenient for them, you know, to fast and to pray. And uh, in most times, it's still the same results that we get. So... It is not bad. The Lenten season is still honored and, and blessed, wonderful time. You know, some of us who fast even during the Lenten season, it may not be every day. You know, there are some of us permanently all through the year, every week fasting once or twice or three days in the week. I mean, in a new month and then once every week. Most of us do that. But then, specifically, we will observe a lot of churches, especially the Pentecostal churches to which, by the grace of God, I serve as a national deputy president will do most of their fasting prayers within January and February. Mm. 
Mm. All right. You know, Thank some you. Uh, 14 days, some 21, 21 days, days, and subsequently like that. So that's the situation. Not that fasting during the lengthening season is bad. That's right. But it's just that they find it convenient to have different times in which they can fast. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Did you hear me? It's like I was cut off. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Let us get some perspective from Nuruddin, who is also here with us. Uh, you, you would, um, uh, as you know, it's a significant time in our country because um, the two major faiths seem to be observing uh, the fasting about the same time, uh, which is a coincidence that we see only once uh, uh, in a while. How significant is it that um, at a time like this, everybody seems to be going through a moment of sober reflection and um, you know introspection on how we generally as a people uh, i mean individually as a people and collectively uh, as a nation uh, and looking at what we need we could do better areas where we could cooperate better and all of that how significant is it that these two faiths uh, are meeting at this point of supplication i think it's uh, very significant to bear in mind even the um, situation in the country we are just coming out of an election very tense uh, <coughs> elections and again if you look at the, what the archbishop said you know uh, the two faiths are cousins mm. they are the two um, the largest to say uh, branches of the abrahamic faith judaism christianity and islam and you talk about the length that the fasting you know and fasting even in Islam is one of the most significant. It's an art of worship that you do between you and your Lord. Mm. In the Holy Quran, God said, Ya yolazina manu kutiba alaykum siyamu kama kutiba ala lazina min kablikum la'allakum tattakun. Say, I have uh, mandated fasting to you like I did people before you so that you should fear God. It's an act of worship. You can give zakat, you can give sarakat just to show up. You can pray when somebody normally pray, but you know, because there are so many people, people are going to pray, you say, okay, only you step back, you pray. But fasting is an act of worship that it is you and your God. You can fast now, you can get into a bedroom and drink out of it. So it's the only thing that links you up. On. And why is it significant again? It's an art of worship that the rich, the poor, the high, mighty, the rulers and the rules, those in the urban areas, those in the rural areas do, share the same thing. Abstinence from food, drink, mm. and sex. You know? So you share the same, feel that hunger. You understand? So that at least, if you are somebody that is uh, given a position of authority, you will know what the people are the downtrodden are uh, uh, feeling at the same time. Talking about the interfaith relationship, yeah, for instance, like I said, the two major faiths are cousins. Mm. You, do t you, you, you do length as a matter of dedication. Same thing with fasting. Total commitment. You do an overhaul of yourself. You understand? And that is why during that time, good neighborliness, you give more arms, you share the little, a cup of tea like this. A date, the Holy Prophet said you can get, you can, Allah will admit you into paradise if you can share a date, just one day, half of it with your uh, neighbor and whatever. You. So I believe, particularly we are coming out of from a very fractious ethnic and religious inclined general elections but look at where we are today so it's a time like he said for a sour reflection reflection you know god did this thing just by not by accident mm -hmm. we as people have to live together happily christianity to talk about good neighborliness love thy neighbor islam talk about peace and what peace to yourself peace with your neighbors peace with your creator mm. What does it mean to you? Well, this year you have uh, Christians and Muslims actually fasting at the same time. I think uh, that is it. I remember, was it in 2000? I was an intern in one of the newspapers. Was it here in Kaduna? Coincidentally, 
the Eid al-Fitr, and Easter, and and no, and Easter and Christmas. Christmas, yes. Okay. Happen yeah. same day. You 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 you, you understand? Mm -hmm. I think what this means simply means is one faith cannot live on an island. The Holy Prophet of Islam, for instance, you know, he provided the best example of how to live with those who don't even profess his faith. Maybe you remember the first hijra migration from persecution from the idolaters in Mecca was not to Constantinople, but to Ethiopia, to King Negus, a Christian king. That was, it was a Christian king that gave sanctuary to flee Muslims sent by the Holy Prophet of Islam. Mm. So what else can you talk about? Mm. After that, Christians came to Medina. It was a Sunday and the Holy Prophet of Islam provided them with his monks to conduct their Sunday service. So there are so many examples. You know, all these rancors, but I mean, you know, like I believe, you know, most of it is political. The political class mm. are just taking advantage of these lines, propagate them, so that they should continue to deceive, intimidate, and to siphon public funds. Mm. You, 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 you understand? Mm. So there is, if you are a Christian or a Muslim, you have no business to go for each other's throne. Mm. And unfortunately, you know, we go to mock more than everybody. Mm. We go to church more than everybody. But the moment there is a misunderstanding because of a council of local government election, the first target are these places of worship. Mm. I'm wondering. Mm. All right, Bishop, uh, coming back to you, how do we begin to appropriate the teachings of these holy times in the way we live and not just limit them to the period when we observe this fast or these holy months as, as, as they were, to, how, to something that become more or less a constant way of life that, that can become a reference point for how we are looked at, we are, how we are considered as a people. Thank you so much. Um, my sorry, dear brother. I believe that, that um, we are living in very wonderful times. Um, I lost a bit of my setting, but I, I, I'm, I'm okay now. So, like Imam said, uh, we can't be going for each other's throat when we're supposed to be living as one in a nation. I believe that, you know, Jesus propagated peace more than anything. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he was called the Prince of Peace. So how can we be a Christian and become the Prince of Trouble? Where do we get that from? When Cain killed his brother, God called from heaven and said, where is Abel, your brother? And uh, Cain had the audacity to ask God, am I my brother's keeper? But for crying out loud, Cain, if you cannot be your brother's keeper, then don't be his killer. And so we must agree. You know, the Bible says the two great commandments, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And the second one is like it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor can be a Muslim, your neighbor can be a Christian, your neighbor can be a Hindu, your neighbor can be a Jewish uh, practitioner, whatever it is. At this most critical time of our nation, let me first of all use this opportunity to and, and thank God for Trust TV for bringing this up, to congratulate um, the winners of this concluded election, the president-elect, uh, Senator Bolami Tinubu and all the other governors, senators, everyone. It may not have been a perfect election. There may have been flaws and um, things not done well, uh, not uploaded on beavers and all of those. I want you to know that we are not living in a perfect world. And so the system can fail and all of that. And uh, But whatever it is, I remember 1979, we had the same thing. All the those who contested, you know, talking about Zig, Awolowo, you know, the GNPP man, my degree, was Zig. All of them gang up and they were going to court to challenge the election of uh, Shagari. 
But thank God, eventually God gave us wisdom, and I don't know how the courts eventually sorted it out, and we're back to stand as a nation. I want to say, please, let's shield the sword. The matter is already in court. Wonderful. If the court eventually decides otherwise, that this is the actual winner, praise God. But if not, and if immigration goes on, of course, which, according to the laws and constitution of our nation, the negotiation should hold on the 30th, I mean on the 29th of May. It goes on, and while the matters are still in court, let's be calm, let's be peaceful. But we also admonish that let there be fairness, let there be justice, if we're going to have a peaceful nation. Let there be fairness in all the dealings with us, wherever. But if we now have a government coming in, let's have a government of national unity, a government of reconciliation. It's not winner, take it all. Let's let's ask those that have won to be mag magnanimous, you know, in whatever they're going to do and embrace other political factors who may not be necessarily from the party that won. You know, all across the states. And let's have peace. We don't have any other country we can call our own. This is the only country we can call our own. We can't run anywhere. One of my friends in Ghana, a bishop, told me, Bishop, we are praying for you more than you are praying. Because if there is any problem in Nigeria, we Ghanaians were in trouble. You will come and oppress us and take over our land. So we want you to have more peace because we are over 200 million. Which country in Africa would take the refugees? Over 200 million people. So please, my people, we are first of all Nigerians, before we are PDP, APC, Labour, before we are Christians, before we are Muslims, we are first of all Nigerians. And let's honor that and ensure that the integrity of this country is preserved, the peace of this country country is preserved. Every one of us has something to contribute to, to make this country a better place to live in. And especially our incoming leaders, we pray that God will give you the wisdom to navigate the, you know, uh, the board of our dear nation to safety. We cannot afford to have infighting, war, and all of that in our country. We have come a long way. And I believe it is time to look forward. We have prayed. Like I quoted in that during the fasting and prayer of the Lenten season, I mean, it was fasting at another period of time. Uh, 2 Corinthians Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, I will hear them. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, since then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. And so I believe that we need to understand that. And God will heal our land. God will give and God will move this nation forward. I believe we need to be patient with each other. We need to preach the gospel of love instead of hatred. We need to talk about the good things God is doing for us as a nation together, not as divided, not as Muslim, not as Christians. I didn't vote for this one. This one can't be my leader. No. Let's be positive and wherever that God puts there, God has a purpose. When I was thinking about this, God said to me, I called Cyrus and I anointed him. He did not even know me, but I anointed him for a purpose that he may fulfill my will. Isaiah 45, I think verse 5 and 6. So God can use anybody to establish his will and his purpose. And it may be shocking to us to find out who God might decide to use to change the fortune of our nation. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop. Uh, we will now take uh, final thoughts as well from uh, Nuruddin Abdullah. You've listened to what the Bishop have said. You've listened to his admonition and charge to both the leaders and the led. Uh, I would like your final thoughts on this. Yeah. <coughs> like you said, um, <coughs> excuse me, the um, political leaders, the electorate, as well as the religious leaders, have a key role to play. Maybe one thing I will add here is this. The religious leaders, you know, they are the leaders of the two major faiths. They should not just use their pulpits and rostrums for endorsement that we saw during the last elections. But they should equally hold the leaders accountable. If we do that, the religious leaders will get the respect of the electorate because they know they tell truth to power. But when they dine and wine with the political leaders, whether they are right or wrong, whether they pursue 
public centric policies or not two things will happen they will lose the respect of their congregation <clears throat> the political leaders as well majority of them profess either of the faith they are either muslims or christians therefore they should not violate their own faith by using it to mount political um, positions only to violate it by discarding the need of those who elected them. It's a pact. And they should know that there will be a life after this life we have. Again, Buhari came 2015. Like play, like play, like they say, in the next couple, two months, or less than Maybe. even 60 days, he will be former Nigerian president. It goes spare our lives. So there will be life after power, and there will be life after the life of this one, you, you understand? In Islam, for instance, we are all shared parts, and we will be held account for all that has entrusted in us. So if you do this, you understand? There will be harmony, there will be peace between the leaders and the left, and there will be mutual respect. And the religious leaders, who are the spiritual guardians of the people, you know, will get their respect, which is now fading away seriously. So I believe uh, the convergence of the Christian Lent and Ramadan fast should serve as an aperture for us. Mm to seek forgiveness, to seek peace in the way we relate with each other. And again, more importantly, you know, the political leaders are one and the same. They are with intermarriage between their children and wards. They do the same business. But me and you, we'll go fighting in their names. When they meet at the airport, they exchange banter. We say, look at these people. What have you said? I think this should be a serve as an eye opener for them um inshallah things will be better for nigeria and nigerians things will be better inshallah for nigeria and nigeria bishop i want to thank you so much for finding time to join us today from lagos from those uh, words of admonition for um those insights those those wisdom that you have shared with us this morning and um, I, we, we hope that you continue to pray for Nigeria and Nigerians and, and uh, so that somewhere in the nearest future we would rediscover the country of our dreams uh, where everyone will look up and say, indeed, I am a Nigerian. Once again, thank you very much for being part of the show this morning. Thank you so much. I appreciate it for the opportunity. Thank you. And um, to Nuruddin Abdullah, as always, uh, today we have kidnapped you uh, <laughs> and given you so many roles. We want to thank you for living true to your commitments to this profession and, to your, and to your faith. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.